it just never fails, does it? You see how much that cut drifted? You know how much work that's going to take to close up? Don't be a tightwad like me. It's just not worth it. When it's time, put on a fresh saw blade. And don't waste your whole day trying to close three quarter inch weld gaps. Uh, hold on a minute. That saw cuts just fine. My bad. This is what will become the bottom of the cart, the footprint. The bottom of this frame is where the wheels will go. I clamped the first piece down and just sort of walked my way around. Now I started at the bottom and I'm working my way up, so any error accumulation ends up at the top of the cart. Had I started at the top and worked my way down, I risk running into the concrete floor and then having to let some air out of my casters to compensate. I've only got the four corners tacked on one side so far. That's plenty to keep this together for right now. If I cared more about how square and flat this thing turned out, I might add more on the back and push the frame around with some clamps until it's square. But instead, I'm going to hedge my bet and do some strategic welding, like preemptive strikes, or try to anyway. No matter what you're welding, if you're welding, like fusion welding, you need to deal with distortion. And take my word for it, it's much better to think about before welding than it is to deal with after welding. And as much as it pains me, we won't get into the details here. Short story is you're introducing molten metal. When that weld bead, or tack in this case, solidifies, it's going to contract. For steel, that's going to pull all the material it's bonded to in towards itself, kind of like a black hole, with a force on the order of magnitude of probably 30,000 pounds per square inch. My hobby store clamps just ain't got a chance. So, knowing that was coming, what I did was leave a little bit of a gap at all of the miter joints. It's small, 32nd of an inch, probably less at this point, about 30 thou, three quarter of a millimeter. And ideally, what that might do is not allow the tubing to bottom out on itself anywhere when that weld nugget pulled it in closer which means the weld is now potentially acting like a little hinge. I could still, to some extent, move this tubing around a bit. It might not be easy, but there's still room there to do that if I really needed to. This particular corner has closed up on me. The weld has pulled it shut. The square is only touching at the end of its legs. The other two corners have done just the opposite. Now the square is touching on the corner and the end of one leg, and the other leg is just sort of floating in space there. In fact, you may even be able to see it. The small gap that I left has closed on the outside and opened on the inside. Right? The weld bead pulled this piece of tubing out and closed that gap, which is okay in my case because I need to move this tubing back in. Had this been the opposite, had the inside corner closed and I needed to move the tubing in, well, it would have been angle grinder time. So to recap, I need to close this corner and open this one, if you know I want this frame to be square. Now frankly, for this frame, given that I have gaps and just small tech welds, it's light gauge tubing, I could just shove this around, hit it with a hammer, clamp it, force it in place, and finish out the welds. But instead of making a whole lot of noise and potentially breaking a sweat, I'm going to take this weld contraction to my advantage. I'm going to start off by welding these inside corners and hope that that cooling weld bead pulls this corner closed. The only thing this thing is missing is its NIST certification. So I have the base made and most of the shelf where the welder will actually sit. I mean, this goes much higher, but it'd be out of frame for you. 
I'm not welding out all of the joints completely, not just yet anyway, for two reasons. A lot of places I have a third piece of tubing that comes in there, for example, or in that corner, and I don't want to have to grind the weld beads down if they interfere. In a couple of places I tried to keep them very flat, just weld at a little bit higher heat, a quick lick with a flap disc and it should be fine. Probably doesn't even need it. Reason number two, I don't want to completely close up the tubing. I still want the frame to vent if it needs to. I don't want to trap any air in sort of a hermetically welded structure. Not only does that get difficult to weld, just because you'll be getting blowout every time you try to close sort of a continuous seam, you know, the hot air jetting out and you trying to put liquid metal to fill the hole. And over time, trapped air could burst this tubing. As it cycles through hot and cold, I've seen it tear open weld seams, for example. Now, if you need to weld something completely for, say, structural reasons, you don't want to drill a vent hole somewhere discreet so that air can still get in and out, but not compromise the structural integrity of what you're trying to build. Next, I'm going to put on the uprights. I'm deburring and sort of cleaning a bit with a flap wheel. I don't know, 60 or 80 grit. Maybe 80. And then just sort of wiping the joint down before I weld it. I like using these coarser flap wheels. They leave a rougher surface and give the weld a little bit more to bite on. Cordless angle grinder, probably the best money I spent in a long time. So convenient. Also, the cleanup I'm doing with it is extremely light, barely even scuffing the surface. I, I can't even feel. The last thing you wanna do is start gouging out your base metal, especially if you decide to paint this thing. It'll look terrible. Angle grinders can be precision tools if you use them with some care. It's how I do my nails. But I might get into that a little bit later if I do some grinding and finishing of these weld joints. Using a small piece of filler wire just to set a gap here. If there's any distortion from the weld I'm about to put in, I want a little bit of space to try to counter that. I'm gonna do the same thing with this upright. Once I'm happy with where it is and it's a little bit more tied together, I'll come in and weld these through. The more obtuse among us may have noticed that I'm sporting a torch switch instead of my usual foot controller. And it's true, I'm not gonna lie. I just unplugged the pedal and plugged in the button. Some electrical tape and I'm off to the races. Since the cart I'm building will end up being biggish, or you know, big for what I usually do, and especially because I've got a camera and tripod in the way, it's much easier to walk around my bench welding as I go with the torch button without kicking my foot controller all over the floor back and forth while I'm trying to take care of business. The 221 has a better 4T mode than the welders I've used till now. In fact, it has two 4T modes, one they call TIG Reset, and I think is a little bit of a weird name, though I haven't really used it yet. Baby steps. If you ever laid awake at night wondering what 2T and 4T meant on your TIG welders, well, hold on to your hats, because we're about to get into it. 2T is what you might usually run for a torch switch. 2T is what you use with a foot controller. Actually, you can't even use a foot controller in 4T. But to understand the difference between 2T and 4T, let's have a look at this little graph here on the front panel. I have no idea what this squiggly line is officially called, but I call it a sequencer, mostly because I'm old and out of touch. The squiggly line represents everything your welder is about to do between the time you start welding and the time you stop. If you think about everything the torch does, like mechanically, literally, step-by-step, step, coming on and off, turning on and off the gas, all of that granular information can be programmed here. So starting from the left, it's how much pre-gas you'll get, the start current, the current ramp up time, up through to the actual welding current itself. Right there is probably where you spend most of your time. Then the slope down time, the final current, and then your post-gas time. At that point, your arc would be off. Everything the welder does between when you start welding and when you stop. I guess shy of holding the torch and filler rod for you. If you need your welder to do that, you'll have to buy a robot. 2T mode is your most basic control. It's an on-off switch. Well, it's a push switch. It's more like a doorbell. It's gonna keep ringing as long as you lean on that button. In the case of a welder, you push the button on the torch and the welder starts welding until you let the button go. The HTP lets you change one or two of the sequencer options when you're in 2T, but not all of them. And I think it's pretty typical of most welders. You can change the slope down time and I think the post gas time. The slope down time is good so your arc feathers out so you don't leave a crater. And the post gas time is up to you. It's basically how much gas you get out of the torch after the arc has turned off. If you're welding stainless, for example, you might want more post gas than if you're welding mild steel. 
Okay, sorry, it lets you do three settings. So in this machine, you can also set how much gas you get out of the torch when you're starting up. But you can see in 2T mode, I can only turn on three of the LEDs in that sequencer graph. Those are the only three settings I can make in this mode. The other end of the spectrum from 2T mode is a foot controller. With a foot controller, you can do whatever you want between the start and the end LEDs on that sequencer graph. If you go to town on your foot controller like a rock and roll guitarist, you can make the graph look like this or like this. Whatever you do with the foot controller, the welder will follow suit. That's why welding with a foot controller is such a different experience, I think, than welding with just a button on your torch. Though, as I said, you know, they're not always that convenient. Here I'm trying to walk around my bench. Other times you might need to get up on a ladder or under a car and, you know, foot controller gets awkward there. I know what some of you are saying, come on this old Tony, shut that pie hole and get back to work. But not to worry, I got one of my clones making steady progress. So on my control freak spectrum, we've got 2T at one end, on and off control of whatever amperage setting you have, and pedal on the other end. Full control over everything the arc does from start to finish. But there is a middle ground, and that middle ground has a very clever name. It's called 4T. Depending on how you set it up and how comfortable you get with it, it's probably closer to foot pedal type control than it is to 2T switch control. A 4T mode is a little tricky to get used to when you first start using it. It was for me anyway. For me, it was a bit like patting my head and rubbing my belly at the same time. In 4T, the welder is now looking for state changes in the button, not just on and off anymore. It's sort of decoding more information from the button than it is in the 2T setting. As a result, it allows you to change more things on the sequencer than you could otherwise. Think of it like sending Morse code to the welder to tell it what to do with the arc. Maybe not as much clicking as with Morse code, but close. Okay, say you have the machine set to 80 amps peak and, I don't know, maybe 40 amps final or 50% peak current. You push the button and you get pre-gas for as long as you keep that button held down. You let it go and it starts to ramp up to your 80 amp peak. Here you're going along your merry way, welding at the 80 amps that you set. Maybe you start getting towards the end of your bead, and you push and hold the button again. When you do that, the machine slopes down to your final amp settings, in this case 50% or 40 amps. It'll give you a 40 amp arc for as long as you hold the button. You know, maybe you're a crater filling or something. When you let it go, the arc goes off and you get your post gas. Bottom line, in 4T you push the button twice and the welder picks up four commands in order to span the whole sequencer graph. To span your whole weld cycle from start to finish. Push, let go, push, let go. That's why they call it 4T. T, of course, stands for Tony. In 2T, you only push the button once and let go to span the whole weld cycle. Like you're welding while the button's down and you're not welding when the button's not down. The point of all this is to give you more control with just a single button on your torch. So here's where I've gotten with the cart. Size seems good. The welder would sit about there. You might notice I've left out one of the verticals at the front. I mean, structurally, it doesn't need it. I kind of like the off-balance look, and I think it'll be easier to get cables in and out from under the machine. If I ever add a cooler, I might put that upright back in just for some protection. I've also attached the casters. A smarter person may have bolted those on, but I just welded them in place. Word of caution, casters are usually galvanized, so you'll want to grind the zinc off before welding. Personally, I just powered through the toxic fumes and sucked it up like a man. I ground them clean before welding. They're not going anywhere. And if one does fall off, well, the welder isn't that far away. In fact, it might even end up being closer. Okay, so this next part is probably a little bit over the top, but it's a cold Saturday in the garage. I've got hot coffee and some time. The cart still needs top and front rails to sort of box in and protect the welder. I mean, it doesn't really need those. I'd like to add them. However, if I do a simple miter, I'll end up with sharp corners. Not sharp, but you know, like 90 degree live corners. Now I have been sitting here debating doing a three piece chamfer, but you know that it'd be too easy. What I really think I'd like is some smooth bends on there, like a nice rounded nose to the top of the cart. Thing is, I can't bend this tubing. I'm not that tight anyway, so I'm going to fabricate them.
You know what? Chicken butt. I think I can make this work, but I don't know, there's something about it I just don't like. Just not feeling it. I'm gonna mold this over a minute, but I think I may go back to the chamfer, like the three-piece chamfer. Maybe do it in four pieces. I changed my mind again. I know this channel has become quite the emotional roller coaster. I took another shot at the fabricated radiuses, like the elbows, made them a little bit bigger. And I think I'm happier now. I wanted to pick up the rounded look from the HTP handle, and I guess the first one I made just wasn't right. I mean, these aren't perfect either, but they're better. If you build your own welding cart, be absolutely sure not to skip details like this. They're of vital importance. I also put in some perforated sheet. It's just sitting there now. Perforated hopefully keeps some of the dust from settling under the welder. Also, it got a little bit more grip than like a smooth sheet. The small recess just keeps the welder sort of where it's meant to be. Hopefully keeps it from sliding out while I'm doing some hard cornering. And if I get overzealous and maybe yank the cables too hard, the rubber feet on the welder at least might stop here instead of just pulling the whole thing out of the cart. I don't know if it looks heavy on video. I mean, it's certainly got some presence here, but it's surprisingly light. Again, the tubing is very thin wall. The bottom is just some galvanized sheet. Again, it's just sitting there for now. I floated both panels, and by floating, I mean I didn't take them all the way to the outer edge of the frame. I kind of like that look. It'll give it a nice visual separation from what will become painted tubing. All right, well, just a few more details, and I think this thing is finished. Next, and this is something I think you're really going to like, I'm going to... Well, would you have a look at that? You really can milk a welding cart.